so good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Jasmine Wilson, and I'm the Indigenous Programs and Community Education uh, Engagement Coordinator at the Museum of Vancouver. I come from the Musqueam Nation. I have ancestral ties to the Squamish Nation, as well as the Cape Mach Nation that's located in the Kukukwak Territory. Uh, so I'd like to virtually welcome you to the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sotho Tooth Nations. I am deeply honored to be able to host this event as we discuss the impacts of colonization and how we're decolonizing ourselves in the spaces around us. Tonight, we'll discuss colonialism and how it's deeply embedded in our systems. We'll hear from four Indigenous artists as they talk to us about what it means to unravel these colonial threads. Through their work, they are reconnecting to their Indigenous identities and using their voices to raise awareness to racism and lateral violence that stems from colonization. This conversation aims to bring awareness to how we can, how we can continue and to educate ourselves on the impacts of colonization during Indigenous Peoples Months and beyond. The idea for this webinar came to me when I was discussing Rebecca Lyons' powwow jacket that's currently on display right now. So if you have time, please come and check it out. And Jamie Smallboy's uh, red ribbon skirt that we recently acquired into our collection. Their stories of how their work came to be was similar. It either came to them in a dream or witnessing the annual Women's Memorial March that takes place in February. With that, I started to think of the work these Indigenous women are doing over the years and how much of an impact they have on our communities, whether they know it or not. This series is meant to highlight and celebrate that work. The women that are here tonight are just four of many women who are doing the work of revitalizing our traditions and culture, as well as unraveling colonial threads. So let me quickly introduce you to the panelists and the moderator for tonight. Uh, we have Rebecca Lyon. She is an Anishinaabekwa from Nipsing. Um, she is the designer and um, uh, is mixed Lebanese and Ojibwe descent. And her family hails from Salter Lake in Northern Ontario. She is currently pursuing her PhD at Trent University and looking at the impacts of regalia, fashion and design on indigenous identity. Rebecca founded the Powwow Jackets in May of 2020 and has been featured in CBC Indigenous and Peter Bureau Examiner. MOV has recently acquired one of Rebecca's powwow jackets. The No More Stolen Sisters powwow jacket was donated to help raise awareness of the human rights crisis surrounding murdered and missing Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited individuals. And it is currently on display until the end of this month, so if you do have time, please come check it out. We also have Jamie Smallboy. She is from Musquatchies Nation in Alberta and is the founder of Red Ribbon Skirt Project, a small grassroots project that gives ribbon skirts to loved ones of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls at the annual Women's Memorial March. Volunteers sew the traditional, traditional First Nation skirts in red, the color that symbolizes missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. It has become a national movement that started in Small Boy's apartment three years ago. MOV has purchased or has one in our collection right now, and hopefully we'll have it on display in February as well. And we have Aline Sparrow. She was born and raised on the Musqueam village in what is now known as Vancouver. Immersed in her culture since she was a child, her mother was one of many women who revitalized Salish weaving in the Musqueam community 35 years ago. Aline learned to leap to weave from her mother three years ago and continues to further her skills weaving and is currently weaving her first large wedding blanket. She pulls on a canoe with the Musqueam Canoe Club. Musqueam hasn't had canoes in the water for almost 30 years. While she works for a mid-sized law firm in downtown Vancouver, her culture and community are what she holds close to her heart. And lastly, uh, we have our moderator tonight, uh, Sesenia Tracy Williams. She is a Squamish bark, we bark weeder, cedar bark weaver, and traditional technologist who has worked in a number of mediums, including yellow and red cedar, mountain goat wool, deer hide, fish leather, metal fiber, stone, and bone. An important element in all of her work is the need to be connected to the lands and waters of Squamish traditional territory and to share what she learns with others. Her work can be found in collections at MOV, Manova, and she has, has 
exhibited her work at many others, including the Bill Reed Gallery, the Vancouver Art Gallery, West Vancouver Museum and Archives. A professional educator, Sassimia, is also manager of the language and cultural affairs at the Squamish Nation. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to, well, actually, before we begin, I'll just quickly say I'm going to be on the back end of everything. So if you do have any questions, feel free to put any of the questions in the chat. Uh, I'll be handling all of that. Um, and if you do like to talk, mm -hmm. just let me know, just raise your hand and everything, and I could give you access to talk. Uh, but without further ado, I'll pass it on to Tracy. Thank you. Thank you. Really excited to be here with each and every one of you today on Hot and Squalwood and Quinn's Quachnomia. Just uh, have a really good feeling in my heart. And thank you to all the panelists for uh, joining us for this exciting um, evening to really talk about um, the ways that we um, were uh, unraveling colonial threads. So I'd like to start first with um, a question for Rebecca. Um, just wondering, what has it been like to reconnect with your culture and identity as an Indigenous women, woman? And which colonial threads come unraveled for you in this process? Well, it's been everything for me. Um, and it's been such a, a hard process, a hard pill to swallow in some ways, because it's unweaving a lot of trauma in my own family, as well as recognizing um, my voice. And so it's been a journey of uh, over 12 years of reconnecting with my mom's heritage. Um, as uh, Jasmine said, I'm mixed uh, Anishinaabe Kwe, so my mom is Ojibwe and my dad is Lebanese. And my mom left home when she was really young. And so we really didn't grow up with that, uh, that knowledge or that being seeped in the culture and the language the way that I wish that we could have been. And so it's been really uh, magical in a way because my mom, my sister and I all together have really um, connected and learned together all of the ways in which um, our identity can be um, and grown stronger as individuals. And I think the, the thing that we're unweaving, as you, as you said, it, is the colonial idea of, of identity and of who we are. Um, and especially when it comes to ideas of the government and who, um, understanding um, what, who is Indigenous and who, who is not. Um, like, for example, my sister um, is status and I am not. Uh, uh, and one of us speaks the language and one of us does not. So it's an interesting thing to, to sort of unweave like who is who. Um, and sometimes it's not always the prettiest of processes, uh, but something that uh, can be really rewarding at the end, I think. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. I really think about who, who creates that identity for us. You know, the blood runs through our veins. Wow, thank you. Um, Ali or Aline, um, did you face any barriers while reconnecting to your culture from community members or Canadian society? And if so, how did you overcome or are you still overcoming it? Um, yeah, I think that... Um, for me, I think it was mostly the racism that I felt um, in school growing up uh, was definitely one of the biggest barriers for me. Um, I was born and raised in the Musqueam Village, uh, which is located in the dunbar Carisdale area of Vancouver. Um, so it's an upper middle class neighborhood, predominantly white. I attended a Catholic school um, and I remember walking into my class in grade, I started going there in grade four. And I remember walking in and just feeling so uncomfortable. Um, because I, I, I was a bit of a heavier kid. I was very tomboyish. So I came in in like these big baggy shorts with like this baggy like golf tee uniform shirt. And I remember looking around at all the girls and they're in their pretty little button ups and their skirts and their hairs are all done. And I just remember feeling very different. Um, <clears throat> and so I was bullied through elementary school and I was bullied through high school. And um, I'm not saying that bullying is something that's unique to Indigenous people. I think a lot of children experience it. Um, 
However, I definitely don't think that my race was used as a weapon against me. Um, I would hear things in school like, oh, you'll probably never graduate because you're just an Indian from the res. Like th these are things that were said to me throughout high school um, and elementary school. And so I think being young and impressionable without me even realizing it and made me ashamed of who I was um, as an Indigenous person, at least in that bloodline. Um, and so I started to identify more with um, my non-Native bloodline while I was out and about in, my, in the community. Um, my mom's mom, uh, my nanny was Scottish Norwegian. So oftentimes I would use that to try and fit in outside my community as a young person. Um, and then when I'd come home, I feel like I was discriminated against because my grandmother, grandmother was not Native. Um, so I felt that discrimination walking in both worlds. I felt it not only going out into the world, but I also felt it at home. Um, and so for me, it's really about finding that balance. Now I'm proud of both sides of who I am. I'm proud that my nanny lived in our community most of her life and raised 10 beautiful children. Um, and when I think of her and her strength and the barriers she must have faced being a white woman living in a native community most of her life, um, on the reserve in the 50s, um, I'm a proud descendant of her. Um, and at the same time, I'm grateful for my mother who had a strong connected relationship with her grandfather, my great grandfather, Edward Sparrow Shwianam. Um, and that kept me connected to my indigenous culture. So for me, it's really about finding that sweet balance. But um, I think that being a young and impressionable indigenous woman, I was just trying to find my place in the world and racism huge played a huge part in delaying my connectedness to my Indigenous culture. Yeah, it's it's such a critical moment, isn't it? Like where we're there, I don't know, I found like I, I had this transition point where um, I, I would fall under Bill C-31. So I wasn't um, status for a long time, but I was on the reserve all the time and I was around all my cousins all the time, but I was also the whitest Indian around. And <laughs> you know, I was just like, but even as a young woman, I knew I belonged to the people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at, at the same time, like I would go and drum and sing with my relatives and then people would be like, who's that white girl over there with you? What are, why are you there? <laughs> it was like, so it was this funny thing. So when I finally moved home to my village and I actually stayed, um, I didn't know who I was. I didn't quite know how I belonged to my people. Mm -hmm. And I, um, when I started doing basketry, I was 25. And when I started, I was like, oh, I, I knew I would never stop. I was like, oh, I can understand why my grandmothers loved this and why it was so important. And I, I, I was crazy. I would go to the mountains in these big high heel boots because I didn't own gear or anything like that. And, and just be like, take this tiny little car with donut wheels and hope for the best. And it was like, but, but that's where I found myself. It's where I found who I was and how I belonged to my people. It's like, you know, um, the, the mountains brought me home. The mm -hmm. trees brought me home and they anchored me in my village. And, and they do it for my children as well. This is just, um, you, you know, it's, it's like how how we know who we are. And it's an identity outside of like a, a job. If that makes sense, it's it's not about that. It it's like how can I um, really passionately share what's taken me twenty five years to learn with other Indigenous women, Indigenous men, children to yeah. to be a collective to how we help one another. And sometimes, despite the the um, the strange discrimination that comes up from other um, people who see themselves as the landowners that makes sense so people who who displace us as indigenous women on our own landscape and say well you can't harvest there you don't belong here well actually yes I do and I know exactly where we are and I know how I belong to this place and how we're connected right here in this place so it's not for a parks board or a conservation officer or anyone mm -hmm. to tell me how I relate to this land and this place. These are really like 
I, I just think important parts around how how we belong um, to where we come from. Yeah. Jamie, thank you for um, joining us today. I'm really happy to see you here. Um, I'm wondering what was the hardest colonial thread for you to unlearn and are you still actively fighting against it? <clears throat> The hardest colonial thread to unlearn. Um, I guess would have would be um, trying to fit in and be accepted, you know, in a society of people that have a different mom than it took on than we do, like our way of thinking, our way of believing. Um, majority of my life, um, after becoming self-aware was spent trying to fit in, trying to be accepted, you know, trying to get that top grade, trying to do everything that Western society, um, you know, has paved for us to achieve or to try and achieve. And I can remember when I was a little girl and, you know, um, here back home, well, here where I'm at right now, in the springtime, you hear this bird and I, always tried to find this bird when I was a little girl. And it sounds like he says neepin, like neepin, you know? And that means springtime, that's like when Scott, like wake up, it's time for new growth. And um, I can remember when I would hear that bird, I couldn't wait to go out there and, you know, smell the fresh dirt, you know, that's underneath, underneath the snow. I couldn't wait to wake up in the morning and see the faces of the people that I loved our animals that were there. And um, that was when I was a child. Then residential school, day school kicked in and all of that abuse that came with it, we were forced to try, we were forced to not be native. We were forced to not be Nahio anymore. And that crushed a huge part of my spirit. So to try get that feeling and connection back, I spent the majority of my life trying to it in, try to be accepted, um, try to make myself feel worthy enough of this society so that they would accept me just for who I am. I still face that today. I'm still not accepted 100% as a Native person, and I feel it every day. I live it every day, but I've come to a place within myself, and I'm trying to teach my children that as long as your connection to Kseimanto and um, Okawemawaski is there as long as you have that belief and that connection, like you said earlier about the trees. My trees brought my children home from foster care. Everything that I used to fight this system wasn't working till I came home and did ceremony. And my brother reminded me these little trees here, they grew up here just like your children should grow up here. Go and ask their Muslim or their grandfathers. Go and ask their grandmothers to help you bring your kids home. That next year, my kids were home. Um, being grounded and remembering that, you know, you walk with the day just like the sun does. There, that's where I find that peace, where I don't feel like I need to fit in anymore. I, you know, go out there in Vancouver and I see a lot and feel a lot of racism, a lot of, you know, microaggressions. Um, they used to infuriate me. I used to let them bother me. I don't so much anymore. Instead, I pray for them because um, you don't know if you don't know. You know, if they, it's like you can't talk to a frog about the ocean because the frog only knows where they are. They've never been in the ocean. So if we can't embrace and accept each other's differences, um, you know, how can we expect to find a balance, right? I don't know if that answered your question. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I really do believe in the power of the trees, the plants, the animals. I used to tell my children, oh, look, there's my friend, the tree, waving to me. And they'd all look. <laughs> the wind was blowing the branch. <laughs> um, does anybody have anything else they would like to um, add to what was the hardest colonial thread to unlearn? Rebecca or Aline? Yeah, I just, I think shame plays such a, 
a role in so many people's lives, especially I know like for me, it was like a shameful thing, a shameful part of who we were. And so I latched on to the other side, the Lebanese side, and we grew up with that. And so that's what I knew. And, you know, even in my own family, there was this level of shame and, you know, um, immediate family members using racial slurs and things like that, you know, and, you know, that gets ingrained in you and you take that on and you, you really, even if you're not aware of it, you're subconsciously telling yourself these things, these negative things. And it wasn't really until I was an adult that I was able to actually accept those things and see the world through new eyes. And, and it awakened uh, a part of me that I didn't know existed, but that blood memory was there. And that shame, I was able to overcome that shame and see the world through these new eyes. Or I sometimes say I'm walking in two different worlds because I, you know, I have this mixed identity. And so I see it through different eyes sometimes. And so I was able to open up that other eye and see um, past that shame. And uh, it really changed my life. And I think that's something that we all are, you know, unraveling and fighting against as that shame that's been ingrained in society against women, against indigenous women, um, against us just for being our very ourselves. And so I think um, that's something that is really important to talk about. Yeah, I really like what you said there, Rebecca, and I completely agree with you. And um, I just want to touch too about because I felt the same way growing up. There is so much negativity, whether you realize it or not. Um, just the comments that are made within your own families, your community, your school, your peers. Um, and I think a big turning point for me, and that kind of ties into colonial threads, is um, I want to give a shout out to Jolene Mitten because she has done a lot of work um, in the Indigenous urban Indigenous community. And in 20... 19, I think. She asked me to walk in Vancouver Indigenous Fashion Week. And I remember she was like, have you ever like considered? And I was like, no, no, no. Like I didn't have a very high self-esteem. I was kind of like too nervous. Um, but she, she convinced me. And so I went and that was a huge turning point for me because I walked into thinking I was just going to go be walking a little runway or whatever. I walked into Fashion Week and I just remember looking around and looking at all of the like beautiful people that were there. And like, successful Indigenous people that were really proud of who they were and their culture and it was like life-changing for me because there was so much pride in being Indigenous and um, it was just it was a really big turning point for me and um, <clears throat> yeah so that was kind of I think my journey like when, once I, I kind of went there it kind of brought me back home to myself. And I, that's kind of when I started my weaving with my mom. Um, but yeah, sorry, I kind of got off track there. No, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for sharing. I want to ask all three of you to um, consider and uh, answer the next question. Um, what do you hope people will learn from your work and from your art? What do you think they'll be able to take away? <clears throat> um, I can go. <laughs> so when I first started the the Red Ribbon Skirt project, um, the reason that I had wanted to bring it to Vancouver um, was because <clears throat> having been, I guess, lost for you know a long time, um, you know that disconnect from my my own identity as an Aosuo and disconnect from my homeland. Um, there was a lot that I suffered and endured because of that, that disconnect. And um, when I first heard <clears throat> the drums of the march downtown, I was homeless at the time. And I was fighting for my children and, um, you know, just facing every possible barrier that you could think of um, as an indigenous woman. And um, it was really hard and I, reached a point um, where I felt like that, I, you know, that I was, I was worthless and I was questioning 
you know, why am I even here? You know, I have these five amazing children and I can't even see them. And why? Because I was struggling because, you know, their father was abusive and, you know, all of these things. And I had given up. And one morning I heard these drums and I thought I was hallucinating. And I, I shared this story with them. Um, Julian and um, I followed the drums and when I turned the corner there was like all these amazing women just marching and praying and you could smell the the medicine and you could feel the drum and the song and um, I didn't know that our people were permitted to do things like this in the cities because you know growing up in Alberta it's a really racist province and there's so many um, the restrictions that we have that I never seen that and that was pivotal to my healing and when I came home to start seeing, attending ceremony you know like growing up before I was in the 60s group um before residential school you know um impacted me individually directly we were a spiritual family well we still are we were a power family you know, we followed the drum, we followed those circles, but, and then all of these colonial um, structures came in and changed everything. So when I started my healing journey, reconnecting with ceremony, coming back into the circles, I didn't have um, a dress or a skirt to wear. And in our, in our way, in our beliefs, <clears throat> to identify yourself in the spiritual realm, as a life giver, you wear a skirt. And as life givers, and this is what I want, but I hope that the, the families or the women that receive these skirts take back is that they reclaim that sacred role as life givers. And in reclaiming that sacred role as, as life givers and everything that comes with that, um, we, will, we will slowly teach people how to protect and respect us. Because a long time ago before colonialism, before settlers came, our women, um, I, I, I will only speak for the Cree women because that's who I am, but I have heard other stories that our women were held with such high regard. Um, there was a lot of um, responsibility from them, for them as leaders, even though that they're women, there were certain roles and responsibilities that were you know, put on their shoulders because of the power that they, they hold within themselves. And I think throughout all these years of the colonial devastation that took place here. That's something that a lot of women have lost. I know that a lot of women in my life that I've met in my 51 years have lost that, that um, ability to see themselves and appreciate themselves as life givers because they were groomed for so long not to um, see themselves as that. You know, our, our the way we dressed was outlawed, our ceremonies were outlawed, like so many things about who we were were outlawed. There was the sterilization, you know, taking the children, even birth alerts still to this day. So when I came back home and I was gifted my first couple ribbon skirts, it meant a lot to me because it meant to me that I reached a place in my life um, that I found myself as that Neho school, that I've opened my spiritual eyes again. I don't know if that makes sense. And I wanted to bring that back to the city because <clears throat> not everybody has the opportunity to go home and, you know, enter those circles. Not everybody has, you know, family that they could go home and learn these teachings from. And I wanted to come back and bring that to the city and, and share with those because when I was homeless and I had nobody, all the women that were in the city that came together, that was my family. And that's one thing that's never been disconnected is that sisterhood between between women. It's just kind of been dormant. And like I said, we were groomed to, to think that we're less than. And I hope that, you know, with the skirts and the sisterhood that come together when they make the skirts and creating the skirts and the prayers that go into every stitch, that it nurtures that strength within us and you know that we could stand in solidarity and when we give them to the families that they feel that love that they feel that connection and um you know that they wear that with pride and that they remember who we are we're life givers we are the only ones that were given that ability to bring life from the spiritual realm 
into this human existence. And that commands a lot of respect and protection. And yeah, that's what I hope they take home with that. It's so powerful. <laughs> it's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Rebecca? Yeah, uh, tough, tough act to follow. But, um, you know, for me, similarly, for like what Jamie was saying, it's, it's about pride and being um, proud of who you are and showing who you are. And, you know, powwow jackets for me started as really this way for me to show who I was and not give a damn about what anyone thought about how I was dressed. Um, and to and it was like very steeped in, in, in indigeneity and I wanted to use language and I wanted to make messages with it and I wanted um, it to stand out. And I wanted people to feel proud of who they were with this item that they were wearing literally on their sleeves, you know? And so I think for me, what I want people to take away from, you know, my art is that it, you should be proud of who you are. You should be proud of being mixed. You should be proud of being um, two spirit, uh, anything, you know, and that's so, so important, you know, not to hide those things and to literally throw it into the colonial gaze and to throw it out into people's faces and just be proud um, is really what I want people to take away. Uh, it's maybe a simple answer, but I think for me, that's really what it's about. Thank you. Aline? Um, I kind of got thrown off with that question. And I, I think it's, I really try to think about it while Jamie and Rebecca were talking and um, it's a hard one for me to answer because um, I'm not really thinking about other people when I'm working. Um, I'm not, for me, where I am, I'm very new to weaving. It's only been a few years. Um, and for me right now, this journey is very personal. Um, and it's for me to connect to my people and my ancestors. Um, and it's an opportunity for me to kind of slow my life down and remember my values and um, spend time with my mother and have her teach me. Um, and so it's, I'm very, when I sit at my loom, the last thing I'm thinking about is anybody else. I'm not thinking about the outside world. I'm not thinking about what people are gonna think of my blanket um, or my weaving. My mom has taught me that when you're making it to put all your good thoughts and your prayers into what you're doing um, because this person that you're giving it to is going to hold that energy. And so I'm thinking of that person, um, but I'm not so much thinking about what others are gonna learn from, I don't wanna say art because it's not really art, it's a way of life with blankets in, in the Salish people. Um, and so at this point I, in my, journey I'm not I can't really answer that because I'm not really yeah it's not other people that I'm thinking about it's it's just me and where I want to go so there's magic in in all of that as well I, I think about um, my own cultural practice and creations and um, a lot of it I, I think about those relationships with the animals that that I'm working with, whether it's creating fish skin or hides or working with mountain goat wool. And a lot of my, my work is kind of hidden in some ways, but it's there. If you look, you'll see it. And um, hidden in the sense of like, it's in community. So it's, it's funny, I was thinking in my introduction, there was a lot of talk around different galleries and exhibits, but, but at the core of who I feel like I am, it's not exactly that. It's a bit more like um, running around in the mountains and, and helping um, facilitate that comfort of being by a tree and knowing that those relationships um, continue despite whatever's happening in the world despite paved roads and despite colonization I don't I don't really think like that um my my elder was saying we don't have word a word for colonization um in in our language and 
um, I think I think for me, I always think about that main focus and the main focus really being the, the continuity part. So when you're talking like about motherhood, I think, yeah, because, you know, I wanted my babies to grow up with knowing access to trees and mountains and places and and making sure that that they don't have to fight as hard as I had to fight because I really did. I, I was like I, I had to fight for every step of the way to relearn my own cultural practice and every word even every little word that I could learn of our language none of it was like easy it's it just time time spent and and eventually like um trying trying to just be um to just be who we are because I, I think that the outer world is just too too complicated um there's no pleasing some of that in my experience <laughs> anyways. And I like what you say about the whole motherhood thing and with your children. Um, my son went to Fraser Academy. So when we went into a lockdown and he had to learn schooling online, he was able to pick his art project for home. Um, so he chose to do a weaving and he made his own first little weaving at home. He sat down with my mom and um, and he did a weaving and it was actually featured at um, the Bill Reed Art Gallery not too long ago um, alongside one of mine and my mom's. And so we all kind of three generations sat there together. <clears throat> um, so yeah, having access to it, it's, it's great being able to raise your children in that. Very powerful. Um, Okay, I'm not sure who would like to answer this question. I'll let you uh, put up your hands if you want to want to say something. What does it um, mean to unravel the threads of lateral violence? And in what ways are you working against this lateral violence? Well, I'll go first. Um, so for me, that's something that has been kind of very present, especially lately. Um, you know, being mixed is such an interesting uh, way to walk through life. And especially as a person who's reconnecting, you know, so it's been over 12 years, but to me, that's, I didn't live this life. I didn't live this life. I didn't grow up on the res. I didn't live a life where, you know, I am visibly native. It was something that was later on in life. And so a lot of people question, you know, my motives or whatever, like my identity. And for me, unraveling that comes down to building my relationships with community and family. Those are what matter to me. And being accountable to those things, being accountable to community and being accountable to family. And I think the stronger and the more effort that I put into that, the more I'm unraveling the lateral violence that I, that I get to unfortunately experience. Um, and I become stronger in who I am and knowing who I am and get, gleaning more knowledge from elders, gleaning more knowledge from community and my own family you know, makes me stronger in who I am and makes it less of an issue to me, makes it, it's like water off of a duck's back, as they say. Um, but I think the problem is that there is, in fact, a, a real issue with lateral mm -hmm. violence, and we're seeing it a lot. Um, and it's definitely something that needs to be talked about because uh, I it it's toxic. It's very toxic. Um, and it can really damage someone's psyche and, and their, their, their person. It can really damage you when you go into community and you don't feel accepted because maybe you're mixed or maybe you don't look a certain way or maybe you weren't, you lost your culture along the way, you know, and people question, you know, who you are if you don't have these, this checklist, you know, it can be really damaging because there is so much trauma in each in each person's li lives, you know, that people don't uh, get to see all the time. And I know that in my, I'm a private person and I don't talk a lot about, um, you know, my family and, and some of the things that have happened, but sometimes I feel like I have to, like I need to tell you about my family story so that you can accept me. When th that's not necessarily the case, I don't owe m that explanation to anyone, um, that trauma, but, 
And the unraveling, I think, is where we start to build those really strong relationships with our communities, with our culture, and with our families, and, and holding on to those, um, those threads. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I uh, experienced a uh, lot of violence within my community because of my mixed blood as well. And I second what Rebecca said um, about kind of looking inwards um, and changing yourself. Um, so um, I don't know, I, for me, like I, in my community in Musqueam, I'm observing a lot of youth and young people uh, reconnecting to their culture and learning language, pulling on the canoe, planting garden for food security, and not only doing those things for themselves, but inviting other community members to be there too. Um, and so I think there is lateral violence in our community. I'm hoping and I can kind of see it shifting a little bit and the younger generations moving towards um, building healthier connections with each other. Um, and so, yeah, I, it's up to us as individuals to work on our own healing path and looking inwards to heal ourselves before we can start looking to others. Um, my mom always told me not to pay attention to what everybody else is doing. Don't compare yourself. Just focus on you and what you're doing and do the best that you can. Um, and if you can make that change within yourself, then you can bring that light to the work that you're going to do in your community. So, yeah. <clears throat> With um, <clears throat> with the experience that I've had and still have with lateral violence, um, I've learned that the first step um, with dealing with it is is healing and understanding the root um, behind what's causing the lateral violence. Like the person, like you know, there's that cliche: hurt people, hurt people, and you know, sadly. Um, though there are a lot of, you know, that my generation and, um, you know, some generation, a generation before me that I've started breaking cycles and, you know, um, trying to deal and heal with the traumas that, you know, they lived in survival mode with most of their lives. Um, it's kind of up to us to create a path for the generations that are following us to see that there are different ways to deal with things, different ways to interact with each other. And that comes with healthy boundaries. And, you know, <clears throat> like I come from a family of, of 12 and my mom's, you know, her, her mom had 16 um, children. Like we come from, you know, large breeding families. So there's a lot of extended family and then adopted family and then in-laws. So there's <clears throat> a lot of people that have unresolved um, issues and on some levels, some are, you know, making changes, some are addressing those issues and some are trying to heal and sadly, some are stuck. Um, I was stuck for a time. I was comfortable <clears throat> with a lot of um, my childhood trauma. I was comfortable um, because that's all that I knew. You know, it was there with me, you know, from the moment I woke up till the moment I went to sleep, you know, that trauma, that pain, that was there. So I walked walked around a lot with that. But like I said, with the healing, um, individually, that's, I think, where it, where it starts is yourself. So I try to teach my children to believe in themselves and to always have kindness and compassion and understanding towards others that a lot of children are still, you know, um, submersed or exposed to um, traumatic lifestyles and that though they're lashing out or saying, you know, mean things to try to look beyond that hurt because you can converse, you can converse with a person in pain just like you can converse with a person, with a person's addiction. You have to kind of find a way to look beyond that and, and feel your way through that. So what I teach my children, and I, it took a long time to train myself, was to respect my thoughts and to respect what comes out of my mouth. Because if I respect what comes out of my mouth, there's little opportunity for me to disrespect anyone else. And that's kind of how I try to walk or tread those waters and with my children. Because um, 
there's a lot of pain. Like that's where it comes from, um, is pain. And the only way that my that I can remember my mom talking about dealing with pain and my and my dad was um with kindness and compassion and an understanding of where they come from. So that's kind of how I try to to unravel the lateral violence. I don't take it on. It's not mine to carry. And I and I try to, you know, help my children understand that as well. It, it's not theirs to carry. I don't know if that makes any sense. That makes perfect sense. Really think about the um he, you know, the there's like the very you can see the violence and then there's the microaggression type of violence that occurs and um one thing that i've been working with with um with my daughter is is around healing how do you heal from violence how do you heal from that harm and a part of um what what we've done is to um look at using the land and utilizing the land and we've returned to the ocean as a part of our healing to remind her that you don't necessarily need medication from from a pill that there's other ways that we can achieve this there's ways in our practice of who we are as Squamish people and we can go back to the water and ask the water to help us and we would go in and I would take her and we would go in the moonlight sometimes. I said, we don't have to be afraid of the darkness. We can go and we can be with the tide and be with the moon. Um, we would go and it, we would go and um, all, all throughout the year, we would go to wash ourselves off because sometimes we would become so heavy with people's expectations of what we were supposed to be of who we were supposed to be of how we were supposed to be and trying to encourage her to wash it off you don't have to carry all that it's it's not ours and we can come here in this place this water this will help us we just have to remember, we have to rebuild and reclaim all of these relationships because it belongs to each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. and two years ago, I took her to the mountains. We went really high up and we gathered some bark. And as we came down, we had the windows rolled down and we're going down this real cluffy hill. And she says, oh, mom. And she's hanging out the window. She's like, I feel so good. I feel so good right now. Mom, why do I feel so good? And I said, you know, I'm not going to be here forever, baby. I won't be here forever, but I want you to remember this day and remember this moment and remember that the land can heal you. This is what's happening here so that when you need it, when I'm not here anymore, I want you to remember what to do. Remember <clears throat> how to take care of your spirit sometimes that's the best we can do you know you're talking about water um when they first found the 215 children in in Kamloops it was you know it it impacted everybody and yes. my children were like asking all these questions and I was feeling all types of ways because you know my older siblings they were in residential school I would have been had there been enough room. So I was a day schooler because there wasn't enough room. Um, but it, it, it impacted everybody. And my children were um, really conflicted. Like they were, they were sad, they were angry, they were confused, like they were shocked. And both of my parents are gone and I live in Vancouver and it's, you know, pretty much just me and my children. And I craved so hard so bad for my mom and dad at that time because I just wanted to curl up and cry and but I had my children to think about and we went to the water we went to third beach and we just like almost like we just went and cuddled in mother earth's lap in that water and it felt so good they all put medicine down they all prayed for the children and um you could literally see the their energy change um, just being at the water like it was so healing. And they didn't even realize that they were doing the ceremony themselves. That's such a such 
a great connection to see, you know, that they're so innocent, they're so pure that they didn't even realize that they were doing ceremony and they were doing exactly what they should have been doing at a time, you know, of tragedy like that. And the water was just so calming and it felt so good to see, you know, that that dark shadow slowly dissipate from their faces just by being there. So healing. It's really beautiful. Um, I'm so sorry that I have to be the one that's like the bearer of bad news here, but we're um, almost close to uh, the end. Um, I just wanted to quickly say like, thank you to all of you, like listening to you all speak. Like this is the reason why I chose you all just because I've read about your journey. I've heard it and witnessed it like with Aline, like we come from the same community, same family, like witnessing you um, with growth and how far you've come and um, everything that you're doing just has inspired me. And just, um, I just have so much respect for you and for all of you and getting to know Rebecca, doing a whole bunch of workshops with you and getting to know Tracy and working alongside with you. And, you know, I would love to do more work with Jamie just because of your story and what the project that you're doing. Um, that's why I chose all of you, just because I know we have a story to tell and something to share with everybody. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for today. Um, yeah, all of the stories are amazing. I'm just reading uh, stories that you have all shared have been incredible. Thank you all for sharing. I need to hear all of you today. I'm so grateful for everyone who's spoken. Uh, and we do have one question, um, since we do have some time, a little more time, um, to answer it. Uh, and if you do have to leave, um, you can. Uh, it will be recorded and we'll be putting it onto YouTube. Uh, so just so you're aware. So the question is, who inspires you to weave new threads of your own on your own terms? Um, I can start and my answer is probably going to be quite short. And, um, for me, like I, I'm just starting my journey. Like I've said before, I'm only, um, three years in. So for me, um, I'm very much focused on the traditional aspect of weaving right now, um, with the hopes of maybe one day trying something new. Um, but for now, I'm really trying to just sit down and with my mom and learn how to properly rove and spin and warp my loom and wrap my head around that um, and really focus on the traditional aspect before I move forward into doing my own thing. So. <clears throat> yeah, for me, um, culture, language, the land, um and community are all things that really inspire me to to weave these new threads and and to i just crave more knowledge from from my elders and from community and from my family and those are the, the things that really inspire me to sort of go forward and come up with these new threads as you say um and especially working with the language that's so important to me um, that really inspires me. And also people like this beautiful panel. Um, these are the individuals that really inspire me, you know, um, to, to, to move, to weave new threads. And so miigwech to all of you because you're all amazing individuals and very inspiring. I think for me, um, it's my concern for our future generations. They have so much challenge and adversity ahead of them that before I leave this, this plane, I wanna know that I have done whatever I possibly could to make some kind of change, some kind of difference so that they're a little ahead of, of the way things are now instead of behind because our future generations are going to be facing such harder times, such harder times. And our ancestors watched out for us. They prayed for us. They did ceremony for us. I know on the other side, they're doing ceremony for us still. And 
while I still have breath in my in my lungs, I want to do whatever I can to try help them. That's why, yeah. It's funny every every time I hear um, the word thread, I automatically think wool. <laughs> I'm like, it just kind of goes to that place, and I think about like, and when I think about those things, I think like one small strand of wool and what it can mean, and how it can embody the mountain goat, and you know, eagle fluff, the bulrush fiber from a swamp, the fireweed from areas that are burned out the urine from a young Squamish boy and think about the lichen um, that that's twisted into it and the yellow cedar and the human that had to do the work to spin it together and then even past that the person who dances it and wears it who's there helping our people um, that small little bit it's like I don't I don't think to change the world but just to ensure the continuity of who we are and how we belong and how we can remember that belonging and what it means to us because this is the truth of who we are and this is the gift that we received to to carry and to share with the future. Thank you. What a real blessing to speak with all of you today. I'm very, very honored to, to be here and just to, sounds funny to share this screen, but truly, thank you. No, I thank all of you. I want to thank all of you again. I mean, you've all have inspired me, like, from the beginning, even before I chose all of you for this for this panel and I just want to say thank you again for sharing your stories and being vulnerable with not only me and all of you but for everybody that uh, came to watch this today um, it takes a lot of courage and um, I look up to you and respect you all individually um, and as women and indigenous women so thank you and thank you for everybody for coming today um, if you want, you could watch the recording on YouTube once again, uh, and hopefully we could do more of these kind of series where we're having this discussion about decolonization, about things that we do face um, in our communities, as women, um, everything like that. So yeah, I am very thankful and blessed to have this going today. So thank you all again. And thank, thank you so much for having me. It was an incredible opportunity. Um, thank you to the other panelists. It was great to meet you. Very inspiring, very, very inspiring, all of you. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, with that, I will end the discussion. So thanks. Thank you for joining everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.